right, we've got a fair amount of material to go through, so we're just going to dive right in. Um, so first, uh, the problem, as everybody knows, um, is that there are more and more devices every day. Uh, this has been called the zombie apocalypse of devices that are coming. Um, we've got televisions, cars, stereos, um, you know, refrigerators, everything. And so even though the short run problem is how do we deal with mobile phones, the long run problem is um, much more of an issue of how do we get uh, our content and services delivered to all of these different devices, um, the stuff that we know now and the stuff that we, we may not know until the future. Um, so how do we do this? How do we deliver the right HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to these browsers? We're going to be doing a survey of a bunch of techniques for mobile web development today. And we're going to start with one called responsive web design. In May of 2010, web designer Ethan Marcotte published this article on Alyssa Park, coining the term responsive web design. Responsive web design is a collection of techniques centered around creating website layouts that adapt to different browser environments. Instead of forcing a one-size-fits-all fixed layout on the many, many kinds of browsers and devices out there, you're looking at an example here. Responsibly designed sites can deliver the same HTML content to a whole lot of different kinds of browsers and devices, but adapt the layout itself to flow most comfortably in the spaces and dimensions available at the given moment. Responsive design tends to lend itself well to mobile where screen sizes and browser characteristics vary so very wide widely. And here you're looking at an off-sited example of an intensive application of responsive design philosophy. This is the recently relaunched version of the Boston Globe. You can go there now in a browser if you'd like uh, at bostonglobe.com and play around with adjusting the width of your browser. As your browser window gets wider and narrower and wider again, you'll see the content layout reflow and adapt to the spaces available to it. The number of content columns, the sizes of images, the structure of navigation, and font sizes, and more, all of these are adapting as the browser environment changes. The responsive web design is underpinned by kind of three primary techniques. First, CSS3 media queries allow us to apply different CSS depending on the current environment of the browser. Secondly, fluid layouts use proportional widths to define content element widths instead of fixed pixel widths. This allows the layout to stretch and scale like you see on the Boston Globe website and other responsive sites. Finally, fluid images and objects constrain images and objects such that they never exceed the width of their parent or container element. This keeps our images in line and keeps them from breaking out of the layout, making us look a little bit foolish. So let's take a look at that first tenet of responsive web design, media queries. Media queries are at their center logical expressions. When they evaluate to true, the contained CSS is applied. Media queries evaluate the current values of certain media properties of media types. Let's look at that a bit because it's a little bit confusing at first. In our example, the media type we care about is screen and the media feature we are looking at on the screen is width. You may have encountered media types before if you've ever included a print style sheet using media equals print in a link tag, for example. Media types indicate the medium on which the user is currently viewing the content. There are a few other relevant media types, but one tends to see screen, print, and the catch-all all media type most often. Like I said, media queries evaluate the current value of media, media properties on a given media type. In this example, we're looking at that width property on the screen media type. This media query thus says, if the current width of the browser window right now is at least 480 pixels wide or wider, apply these CSS rules. Otherwise, don't. It is common to combine a number of media queries together to create a fully adaptive layout. In this next slide, we'll see three media queries together. The first media query has CSS rules for narrower screens, 480 pixels or narrower. The second contains rules to apply to window widths in the range between 400 and 800 pixels inclusive. You can actually totally combine more than one criterion in a single media query, query like this one does with the AND keyword. And at the bottom, we see a media query that applies CSS for window widths that are 801 pixels or wider. When a media query and its contained CSS represent a significant shift in content layout and flow, 
For example, say if that middle media query we see here added a second column and altered the form of navigation used to best fill the space available, that point in the design is often called a breakpoint. This brings us to the second principle of responsive web design, fluid layouts. Fluid layouts are CSS layouts that, de that define the size of their content areas in proportional units, most often percentages. So instead of declaring that a given sidebar, say, is 250 pixels wide, we want to express that width as a percentage of its containing element so that as the window size changes, it can scale up and down. To convert a fixed width element from pixels to proportions, we use what is called the fluid formula, which you see here. In a nutshell, you can derive the proportion, that is the percentage units we're going for here, by dividing the original pixel width of the original, pixel, of the original element by, by, the target, uh, by the width, the pixel width of the target, uh, excuse me, the contextual element, which is generally its containing element or often the width of the entire layout. Now this is a little bit confusing in abstraction, so it's probably easiest to use an example. Here we go. Say we want to um, convert a 960 pixel wide fixed layout and we want to convert it to a fluid one. We want to retain the proportions of the layout as it appears in 960 pixels, but we'd like it to flex and stretch to other widths, both narrower and wider. So let's start with that 240 pixel wide left channel there on the left. The 250, 200, excuse me, 240 pixels is our current width and our target, therefore. The context here is the width of the entire layout, 960 pixels. We want the resulting proportion to equate what the proportion is now between the 240 pixel element and the 960 pixel layout. So we do the simple math of dividing target by context, 240 by 960 pixels, and we get 0.25 or 25%. Now the bit of extra math you're seeing here on the bottom of the screen indicates that sometimes with different widths you won't end up with as clean results. Say our, our width that we're working with is 250 pixels instead of 240. You may end with, up with quite a few decimals after, after your percentage. It's okay to go ahead and just copy and paste that into your CSS um, and that's fine. It can be a little bit tricky to get your head around the notion of context and the application of the fluid formula. So we will be providing links on our blog. We'll, we'll let you know a bit more about that in a bit. Um, about a number of the things we're talking about today, including more details on applying the fluid formula. Finally, to make things a bit more exciting before we talk into the third and final element of responsive web design, we'll do a quick aside here into the world of fluid layouts and media queries. And we've been experimenting at Cloud4 with M-based media queries. Now, I've been showing you pixel-based media queries in terms of screen width or window width, but we've been looking at M-based ones and found that they often support Zoom content a little bit more elegantly than pixel-based media queries. If this is kind of newer stuff and not all the questions have been answered, but if you're curious, you can go ahead and go to our blog at blog.cloud4.com and read our recent blog post about this topic. So, to move along, the third and final element of responsive design is called flexible images and or media. It is as simple as the CSS rule on the slide, which you apply to images and objects. Assigning this max width value of 100% keeps images and objects from breaking out of their parent elements and keeps them scaling and stretching and flowing with the layout comfortably. Uh, one thing on the images is that you've got to make sure that you don't include the height and width attributes in the, in the HTML markup. Um, and then the CSS rule will take care of everything else. Um, so this sounds great, right? So what's the catch? Uh, and what, what we see a lot of is we see examples of people implementing responsive design, sort of like this example from our book, where um, this is just a fictitious uh, pub where you, um, the page looks great on a desktop device, uh, and then it also looks great in a mobile device. Um, Everything seems from all appearances to be working exactly the way that you want in terms of responsive design. Unfortunately, what happens is, is that if you use a test, there's this um, website called blaze.io slash mobile where you can actually, they take um, iPhones and Android devices and actually go out and test web pages and check to see what the, <clears throat> what the size of the page is, how many seconds it takes to load, a bunch of information about this page. And what you would see is that even though that page looks like it's optimized for mobile, it's actually six megs in size. Um, and this happens quite a bit. And why does it happen? Um, the first piece is, is that 
this page is slow because there's a ton of JavaScript and a ton of images that are slowing down the performance of the page. Um, let me see, I'm just going to wait just a moment for the webinar software to catch up with us. Um, all right, there we go. Um, one of the first things that happens is that it, on that mobile view, um, there's code to implement a map, but that map only shows up on desktop. Um, it doesn't show up on the mobile version of the site. Um, and the way that it's being hidden is because it's using um, display none and a media query that hides that information um, from the screen. The site, a similar thing is being done with images. So uh, the media query is hiding a large image that's in the header using display none. And both of these techniques cause problems because the, the display none attribute applied to JavaScript doesn't prevent the JavaScript from continuing to execute. Uh, what we found in doing research, if we went back and looked at Ethan Marcotte's original List Apart article and, and simply took the images that were desktop size images and resized them to the size that they would be if they were actually being displayed on an iPhone, on an Android device, sort of the, that mobile resolution was that it was 80% smaller. Um, just taking those images, opening them up in Photoshop, and, and resaving them web optimized. Um, so delivering desktop size images to mobile devices, uh, particularly on web pages that have mul multiple mobile devices, then expecting the browser to scale those images can be pretty problematic, um, which of course is a tad disappointing. But don't go, give up hope entirely. We have some great techniques that we can use and, and some ways of thinking that kind of get us out of some of these ruts. One of these techniques or one of these ways of thinking is, is something called mobile first or sometimes also content first design. Website layout and design has historically started with the desktop. Even though we talk about progressive enhancement, we tend to have a habit of building a desktop site and then subtracting out layout and functional elements to simplify our sites for mobile. Mobile or content first instead turns this on its head. We start with a baseline experience, like on the bottom of this slide, and then we start with the simplest and clearest, the most content-centric version of our site, and then we progressively enhance for larger and more full-featured browsers and devices. This is about giving more than just lip service to progressive enhancement. There are a few techniques you can use to implement some of these ideas right out of the gate and avoid some of the performance problems that Jason was just talking about. First, you want your basic and baseline CSS, CSS first. Don't put it inside media queries and because that's the CSS that everyone will be getting and sharing and building upon from the simplest device to the biggest smart TV. Secondly, from there, make sure you're cascading your enhancing CSS and media queries from smaller or simpler out to larger and more complex in order, using the, using the cascade inherent in CSS correctly. So why do we keep our baseline CSS out of media, outside of media queries? A couple of reasons. As mobile web genius Brian Rieger of Yubu once said, slightly enigmatically, Quote, the absence of support for media queries is in fact the first media query, unquote. I like to meditate on that a little bit. For example, it may come as no surprise that Internet Explorer was a bit late to the media query party. By making our shared baseline CSS outside of media queries, we assure that browsers that fail at media queries get at least the, the, the baseline experience that we've designed, but not that we're giving up on IE here. We have a few tricks up our sleeves. One option is to use those tried and true IE conditional comments in your HTML to include an IE specific style sheet. Another option is to use a JavaScript polyfill like Respond.js to give IE support for media queries and make it behave a little bit more like the rest of the browsers out there. Keeping one's eye on performance concerns is also key, as we've heard, for creating successful responsibly designed sites. Keeping CSS images within media queries usually makes browsers only download those CSS images that are in the media queries that are currently being applied. Not always, but it's a best practice. So in this example, instead of having a CSS image defined in our baseline and then subtracting it out by using display none or giving a different background image that is a second download, we are only containing the CSS image within this rule. For example, the image in this background rule for the he dot header selectors enclosed in that media query, and it only applies to windows wider than 480 pixels. 
Most well-behaved browsers that are narrower than that or for whatever reason this media query does not apply won't download this image. It's not 100%, but it's a great practice. Now let's circle back, back to that map that Jason was talking about inside of this iframe. Hiding it with CSS display none in a media query isn't helping anyone. All of those heavy assets are still being downloaded even if it's not being shown. So another possible sol solution for this instead would be to whip up some JavaScript that inserts that iframe tag into the page if and only if the available space in the browser window is appropriately large enough to make it reasonable. That means those assets won't get needlessly downloaded for narrower browser windows. Another problem that we looked at um, and, and that there isn't a great solution for is necessarily the, the issue of the image tag and the fact that each image tag can only have one source. Um, and this becomes an issue when you really would like to deliver different images to different size screens. Um, so one solution might be to say, hey, we should just have the server solve this problem. But on the first load for the server, the server really doesn't know anything about the browser's characteristics. Um, it doesn't know whether or not the browser can support JavaScript, whether or not it supports images, video, flash, any of these sorts of things. Um, so consequently, the server can't modify the image tag and provide something um, that you know, provide an image tag that's appropriate, point to the correct source for that particular image. So there are a couple of different options on how to address this. Um, the first option is to use JavaScript to set screen width in a cookie. Um, so the way that this works, and there are different variations on this technique, but essentially what you have is you've got an image tag, and then somewhere in the image tag you contain the information for where the small version of the image is and where the large version is. In this particular example, um, the large version is appended to the, uh, to the URL parameters. It could be a data dash attribute, which is an HTML5 attribute where you can store whatever information you want. And there could be multiple sizes of images. We're just using small and large to simplify things. Then what happens is that there's JavaScript used to set cookies, um, to set a screen width in a cookie that is then delivered to the server. And then now the server knows information about um, the, the width of the screen and thus can pick the correct image. Um, the way that uh, a lot of these scripts work is by using a HT access file with a bunch of rewrite rules in it that then looks at the cookie's contents and makes a decision about which image to download. Um, pretty simple stuff. Unfortunately, browsers have become really, really focused on performance. Uh, it's, it's actually fortunate for everyday use, but it's a little bit of a bear if you're a web developer trying to solve the problem of images and responsive designs. In particular, um, what's happened is that a lot of browsers do preloading of images, uh, and so they look ahead in the document, even though they're still downloading JavaScript and so evaluating portions of the document, and start requesting images. Um, what happens is that the efficiency gains gained by those prefetching has, um, are lost when you do this sort of technique where you set JavaScript uh, because the JavaScript may not execute in time before the images start downloading. So you end up with race conditions. The other problem with this technique is that there's no contract between you as a web developer and the browser as far as when it's going to evaluate the JavaScript, when it's going to set those cookies, sort of how it's going to handle images. Um, so this is an unreliable technique as things go forward. Um, Second option is to use a NoScript tag to prevent images from downloading. This one works reliably um, because what happens is that the NoScript, anything inside of NoScript actually doesn't exist in the document, um, it doesn't exist in the DOM until or unless JavaScript isn't present and the browser knows the moment it loads a page whether or not it supports JavaScript. So what happens is none of the images get preloaded um, and then you use JavaScript to pull out the information from the NoScript tag and create a new image tag in the page. While this technique works, um, it's problematic because you've essentially changed basic HTML markup. I mean, there's, there are a few things more fundamental than the image tag and changed it in a way that fits only one solution and doesn't, doesn't, isn't forward-looking in any sort of way. Um, there's real concern about what happens five years from now when somebody picks up that, that web page and decides, you know, what are we going to do about it. 
The third option is to use a service. So Centra.io uh, um, or Centra.io has a service called uh, Source. It used to be called Tiny Source, where you can supply a image URL. Um, you do source.centra.io slash and then the URL of the image that you want resized. And that service will automatically resize images to the correct um, size for that particular device. Of course, there's a question, right? So one, you're routing everything through a third party, which could be unreliable for you. And how does Centra know what size image to send anyways? Well, what they're doing is they're using device detection, um, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, which is the way in which a server could know more about a device before it loads. But um, if you're going down the route of device detection, you're making um, a bunch of assumptions about the environment and the device, which may not prove to be true. The conclusion that a lot of us have come to is that the only real solution to the image problem in responsive designs is actually a new element. Um, the W3C, we've got a working group there, uh, responsive images community group, working on alternatives to the image tag. Uh, right now we're centered around picture and nobody really likes necessarily picture as the, the element, but we can't use image or um, either IMG or image, both of which browsers have for years have attributed um, behavior to. So we need a new element that will allow us to do something much like what the video tag does with multiple sources and um, media as an attribute where we can use media query like selectors to make decisions about what images will be used. Um, this is stuff that we're working on and we're hoping that, that we can get browsers looking at it. Um, just recently, Apple has uh, pushed in the CSS4 committee um, and actually in, checked into WebKit something called image set, which is another thing related to actually providing different resolution images, trying to solve the retina images problems. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done in this space to provide experiences that are both performant and look great on these different screen sizes. And all this work is worth it. If in the example we were looking at before, if you went through and did all the work to, um, to make the, the, the site optimized, you'd go from 3 megs to um, a little under 400K. So a significant speed increase just by making that. And from, I think it was like 14 seconds, I can't remember what it was originally, down to under 3 seconds. Um, for this reason and for a bunch of other reasons, mobile first responsive web design is a bit difficult. Uh, people are still trying to figure out how to handle embedded images, what to do about content reordering. Your menu might make sense on desktop at top but um, belongs down below on mobile um, or that may be where it makes the most sense. Um, CSS Flexbox hopefully will allow us to do something about this but uh, it's, not, it's not here yet so we've got a bunch of work to do before we can make that happen. A um, bunch of third-party widgets, especially advertising widgets, and um, just generally how do we integrate with content management systems, how do we deal with um, business requirements that prevent us from doing responsive designs. And because of this, it's not a surprise when I did a survey last year of mobile and desktop responsive web designs, what I found was that 25% um, of responsive web designs, their mobile view was actually larger than their desktop view. Um, and something like, um, what was it, like uh, I can't, I actually can't read my own slide because it's small on our view. Oh, it's 38%, sorry, uh, had less than 10% savings between the, um, the mobile view and the desktop view. And it should be better than that. Right, so performance is always something to keep in mind when you're doing those client side pieces of work. Um, we're going to jump to the other side here for a little bit and talk about the uh, little bit about that elephant in the room, which is server-side device detection. Device detection works by using clues in the client request, typically the user agent string. And usually these clues are used to make some decisions about what we want to do, what kind of content and what kind of experience that we want to deliver to that user. Often user agent sniffing is combined with a device database which contains information about the features and support of a whole lot of different devices and browsers based on usually their user agent strings. So this is a dangerous area of conversations and passions tend to run high. Sometimes user agent strings are called the third rail of web development. People say kind of mean things. Um, and many believe that rerouting someone to a separate mobile site is evil. 
And we get people saying things like, user agent sniffing must die. Nice job advocating this bad, bad practice. So haters gonna hate, but why are haters hating in this case? Well, there's a few different reasons, but a large piece is that user agent sniffing has had a bad rap since the 90s when it was used kind of nefariously on sites that would say things like, this site best viewed in Internet Explorer. Those sorts of things were rife. They prevented people from doing what they wanted to do on the web, and they were poorly executed. That stigma has stuck around. In the wrong hands, user agent-based device detection and content adaptation can be a wretched experience, keeping users away from the content experience they're really after. It's not like mobile developers don't know this. They know the dangers and the foibles of user agents, but there are situations for which device detection is the best tool for the job at hand. There are times when you really need information about the device accessing your site and its browser before you deliver the site. And if you look at the top 30 Alexa sites, the Alexa top 30, you'll see that 25 of them use some form of device detection to make decisions about content or for redirecting users to their mobile site. And what about those other five in the top 30? They don't have mobile optimized sites at all. This is an excerpt from our book, and it shows one strategy that we talk about for managing device detection. We suggest using device classes if you're doing this, logically grouping a small num a number into a small number of groups, similar devices, and then you treat the devices in the group, those groups very similarly. This can help maintain sanity and prevent you from generating a different site for every single possible combination of different device features out there. It can be the difference between sanity and craziness. A few more pro tips. First, support every URL on your site, no matter what device. No matter how folks are getting at that content, let them get at it. Very few things are as frustrating as heading to a deep, 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 deep link to, to content on your device and getting redirected to the landing page of that site's mobile site. People really, really hate that, and I understand why. Make sure you're supporting URLs. Another thing about device detection is that if you're using it, you are, in fact, kind of signing up for an arms race. New devices, and therefore new uh, user agents, new browser versions, new user agents, again, coming out constantly. Keeping on top of that is, an, is a massive task and probably one you don't want to undertake unless you're in some sort of large organization that finds this very fun and fascinating. There are a few pieces of software and tools that can help you out in the data, or excuse me, device database re realm. One is the Werfel uh, device database, now under the auspices of Scientia Mobile, which is a, uh, a vast device database and now a cloud service if you should like to query against that device database. Another similar product offering is Device Atlas, which also provides a deep data database about different devices. But don't think that the decision that we're presenting here is between doing client-side responsive design and server-side stuff. It's not necessarily one or the other. In this post by Luke Wroblewski on uh, REST, which stands for Responsive Design and Server-Side Components, uh, Luke talks about really coordinating a dance between the back end and the front end, using the best aspects of both to build an experience that's the most appropriate for your users. A lot of mobile web development at this time is evaluating the tools you have, the approaches that you have, and deciding what, which pieces of which are most appropriate for your project at hand. Uh, one thing, um, just to follow up on this idea uh, that we tend to think about is that even in cases where for whatever reason, and you know, who knows what reason on what project you need to use device detection, but if for some reason you end up in a scenario where you need to use device detection, I don't think that there's a, a single instance of um, building separate sites or using different templates where we don't use responsive web design on the templates because even the iPhone itself doesn't have one resolution. Between portrait and landscape, it changes its resolution. And so if you're not building pages that adapt, um, even in a scenario in which you are using device detection and using separate themes, you've got a problem. Um, so you've got to you've got to build sites that respond in some way or another. And then where you add in server side components, whether it's to resize images or make decisions about images, these sorts of things are um, have to be made on a project by project basis. Um, so we wanted to take a look at some tools to make your life easier. Um, 
And uh, wow, it created a really horrible shadow of the web on our software. So ignore the typeface. Um, the first one that we wanted to talk about is one um, that is called um, uh, response, responsive.is. Um, and you can go to this in your browser. And it's just, it's, it is a really, really neat way to sort of visualize what responsive designs are going to look like in different devices. Now, generally, we don't encourage people to think about breakpoints, sort of think about where they want their media queries to be based on the devices themselves, but instead to think about um, where breakpoints are based on where the content starts looking bad, because the resolutions of devices change. So 320 by 480, um, which is the iPhone resolution, um, you know, who knows if that will actually be the same resolution down the road, and it's definitely not the same resolution for all mobile devices. But this device, or this particular website, is pretty nice because you can enter in any URL and you can see what it would look like in a desktop view, and you can see what it would look like in a, um, in a mobile view, and you just get a nice representation of this. It's really slick, um, fun to work with. Another tool that's probably a little bit more useful for testing this is something that Remy Sharp put together, which is responsive picks. Um, and the way that it works is that you can actually enter in uh, specifically the resolution that you want to test on. Um, this is really great for trying to find out the specific pixel width where something stops, starts looking wrong. Um, it can be a little hard as you're controlling your browser window and sort of resizing it bigger and smaller to, to get that fine grained. Um, so to have something that allows you to enter specifically an increment, um, you can sort of see there the little up and down arrows that you can increase the resolution, decrease the resolution. So that's responsivepix.com. Um, the tool that we use more, more frequently, um, whether it's on, uh, in Chrome or in Firefox, um, and there's even a bookmarklet that you can use, um, this is a Chrome extension called Window Resizer that actually will show you as you resize the window, it will overlay for a second what the current resolution is of that window. Um, you can also do the same thing with the Web Developer uh, Toolkit on Firefox. Um, and like I said, there's a bookmarklet that you can get to um, and we can provide a link to later in that blog post that contains information or will basically overlay the screen resolution of that page. And being able to do that on responsive designs is extremely helpful to be able to figure out where the breakpoints are and where you should place those media queries. So recently, Adobe launched a new product called Shadow, which is free. It's an inspection and preview tool that allows you to pair with a whole bunch of different devices from your desktop and debug and test mobile web pages on them at a single time. It's built on top of the Winery tool, uh, which is a, a debugger, and Shadow works currently on iOS and Android products. So it's not every mobile device out there, um, but it does capture some of the most highly used devices out there. So Shadow is installed as an extension uh, for the Chrome browser as well as a small helper application. This extension allows you to see the other devices that are currently paired and running Shadow, and, and then you are able to see what's going on on that device right now. You control which web page is rendered across the different device, you have, device or devices you have paired by navigating within your own desktop Chrome browser it causes those pages to be loaded and rendered on your paired devices. Here's, and here's um, our web, web page running in Chrome, and then here it is running in shadow on an iOS device at the same time, controlled by that Chrome browser. If you want to inspect what's going on on a device as it's running shadow, a, a, a web page rendered in shadow, you can use a WebKit like inspector just like this um, to see all of the elements live on the page. You can also look at JavaScript stuff and resources and CSS and, and other goodies like that. So if you were to select an element in, in the uh, current render tree here and then um, go back over to the device for which you just selected that element on, you'll see it's correspondingly highlighted here. It's just like using WebKit Inspector for your own browser, except you'll see the highlighted elements in the um, paired device selected. One, one thing um, that Liza mentioned there, but that I just want to emphasize is that um, in this example, uh, and. I apologize, I put together this example, I didn't think about it until now. Um, we just showed one device connected, right, an iPhone connected to uh, the Chrome browser. But what's really great about it is that you can have, you know, you can have 10 phones, tablets on your desk, all of them running Adobe Shadow, all of them connected to the Chrome browser, 
you enter in a URL and it goes and it loads on all 10 devices at the same time. You open the web inspector and you make a change to the markup and that change is reflected instantaneously on all 10 devices. Um, so from a mobile development perspective, this is a godsend. Time saver. Yes. I actually, um, I, you know, it, it, it can feel a little bit iffy um, with products that only work on certain um, uh, platforms, like this is obviously WebKit only and um, it's only on iOS and Android right now, but my goodness, it has been a time saver for us. It's been great. So um, cool stuff coming out these days. On a much higher level, I wanted to share the Future Friendly website with you. You can find Future Friendly at futurefriend.ly. Uh, this is, a, like I said, a higher level site looking um, and coalescing a number of themes that we, Jason and I, and our colleagues see in the current mobile revolution landscape. And there's some links uh, to many useful, more specific resources. We encourage you to check that out. Anyway, we've come to the end of going on and on about um, mobile web. Thank you for being so patient and hanging out with us. Um, as you know, uh, Jason and I recently published Head First Mobile Web with O'Reilly. And in the book, uh, we go much, much, much in depth uh, about the things we've been talking about today, and we touch on and go in depth about a lot of things we haven't even had time to talk about today. All right, so I think at this time we're going to go through some of the questions from the chat room. Um, Give us a moment to sort of figure this out. Um, yeah, we've not used this interface before. Um, okay, uh, we've got a question on uh, from David about what specific devices do we usually design slash test against. Um, from a design perspective, it depends on the project. Um, so we've done everything from a project where uh, we were working on a web, a web page that was going to be used exclusively on iPads by commercial fishermen out in the ocean to categorize and collect fish um, to projects where we were supporting pretty much every feature phone that we could. And at the beginning of projects um, up to, you know, smartphones and desktop and, and that sort of stuff. So at the beginning of projects, we, we tend to look at a combination of the general information that you can get about a, you know, geographic region based on where the project is going to be used and sort of the customer base for that project, um, specific information about the, um, the demographics or the audience characteristics of that project. So if, we, if it's an existing site and we can look at analytics, that's that can be helpful. You have to be careful if the analytics are um, JavaScript based, you may miss activity from feature phones. Their desired audience, so if you're doing something with a, um, for example, we've done work or we were, we were looking at a project with um, a nonprofit organization that wanted to reach a lot of people who are pretty much across lower income levels and so feature phones were much more important than um, and then also technical features. So if for some reason, in order for the site to work successfully, you have to, um, you have to support cookies or su to log in or support SSL or support, you know, WebGL, like whatever the characteristics of that, that, that ends up being places where we end up drawing the line in terms of the devices we design for. Um, and so every project ends up being slightly different on that regard. And then we pick the test devices based on that. Um, and then, Liza, you want to speak a little bit more? I have something slightly depressing to say, which is I don't think that anyone has actually nailed this. Um, the testing situation with the mobile web is very complicated. Um, it's very difficult, as you may know, to get your hands on devices, uh, get them on, because, uh, you know, even if you have a device, that doesn't mean you're actually seeing all the shades of behavior of that device. We've seen um, major differences just between the same device with the same browser on different carriers. So there is a little bit of chaos out there, and just because you haven't tested it doesn't mean it's not broken. So yes, it, it is a significant challenge, um, but some of the tactics that Jason just talked about can uh, give you a leg up. Yeah, and Liza, uh, to me, sort of coined a, 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 like a great phrase that we repeat quite often here, um, which she just alluded to, which is this idea that like essentially, if you think your site's working and it looks great, um, you simply just haven't tested on enough devices because it's broken somewhere. Um, and once you accept that that's the reality, then you start trying to figure out the ways to break it, to make sure that it breaks in a manner that's, um, that's still functional. Um, 
one other question Brandon had asked, uh, what's the first responsive, design, responsive site just before responsivepix.com? That was uh, responsive.is. Um, all right, uh, sort of going back to the beginning here, um, uh, a question from Christina asking about where, where are you getting the variable from the browser to know what screen size the CSS needs to match? Um, Take that. Okay, there's a couple pieces of this I could see as being the source of the question. I'm not quite sure if she's asking about um, how I know to use um, width or min width or max width or the syntax stuff. We will provide some links in our updated blog post shortly that link to more information about the specifics of CSS media query syntax. If you're, uh, if you're asking about how do I know which screen sizes I care about, um, in our examples, we saw a bunch of stuff around 480 pixels. That was pretty arbitrary. When you're designing layouts that you want to be responsive and you wish to have breakpoints at which um, content reflows, uh, usually it's going to be on a design-by-design design basis. You start looking at that layout in your browser, you start resizing your browser, and you get to a point, you know, maybe as you're making your browser window a little bit narrower, a little bit narrower, say you have three columns in your design, you'll get to a certain point and realize it's looking too tight. That's your, your pixel point or your break point at which you want to say this is the maximum width where you should have three columns and everything narrower than that should get two or one or however many. Um, I'm not sure if I nailed your question there, um, but those were pieces that I think could be uh, giving you a bit of confusion. Yes. Um, Andrew asked uh, how do pixel-based widths work with uh, new high-definition screens? Uh, the first piece is that um, high definition screens, retina displays, just pixel density overall has changed to the point where um, uh, we have, um, uh, it's, not, it's not the pixel itself. We have what's either called CSS pixels or virtual pixels depending on who you listen to. So even though a retina display has a higher resolution on say an iPhone, it still reports itself as 320 by 480. So for the purposes of design, you still end up working with that resolution, sort of thinking of that resolution. In the CSS, you can actually, um, again, select devices that have uh, higher pixel density and deliver different CSS images to those devices so that they get the higher resolution images. As far as the image tag is concerned, um, unsurprisingly, there's not a really good solution for that yet. Um, there was a blog post that I wrote a couple weeks ago about how Apple.com is handling Retina images for the new iPad, and it's really problematic. Essentially, they're, they're loading the desktop size images and then replacing them with the Retina images. Um, and I, you know, generally that's not a good solution. That's why Apple is, um, you know, pushing into WebKit changes to the, um, to the way in which images are handled to, to provide multiple size resolutions as hopefully, um, and it's image set is what, you, if you want to look into this, all of this is new breaking stuff and nobody has a good solution yet. So most uh, devices, like Jason was saying, that have a high pixel density, that is more than 70, 80, or 90 pixels per uh, inch, do have a differentiation between what the actual device pixel is and what the number it reports to the browser. This is not always the case, however, and does bring up some interesting problems. Um, for example, the Kindle does not have a difference between its device pixels and its virtual pixels, at least on the Kindle Touch. There's a little bit more about this in the post I wrote last week on M-based media queries on our, our blog site at blog.cloud4.com. So you guys got a little bit of reading to do, I guess. All right, so question. Does the inclusion of uh, respond.js affect the site performance on mobile? Um, I don't believe it does on mobile. Because if you, do your, if you do your media queries where you're starting with the mobile site and then work your way up to desktop, um, then the devices that Respond.js is supposed to help understand, for example, um, Internet Explorer mobile will not, will not need Respond.js because it is getting the mobile version of the site. Um, the question, though, actually is true, like, does it actually affect site performance? It does, in fact, affect site performance in Internet Explorer on desktop. Um, and so you need, to, you need to worry about that. You need to take a look at that and figure out um, whether or not it makes sense to, to include it, um, whether it ends up being too slow. Um, generally, my thought is, is that if we can get away with using a, um, 
using uh, the conditional comments as opposed to using the respond.js, you're better off. Yeah, and sort of a related question um, is uh, how do, does media query performance compare against adapt.js? Well, native media query, you know, if you've got native media query support, it's, it's sure as heck going to be faster than using a JavaScript polyfill. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty easy one. But um, so you're not using, a, a, you know, typically you don't necessarily want to use adapt.js for um, browsers that already support media queries, but um, it can, it, you know, it is a good polyfill when you don't have that available. Certainly using the browser's own media queries is going to be more performant, as they say. Yeah, so Nathan, the reason why Nathan, Nathan Smith um, actually created adapt.js, and, and one of the things that he was trying to get around was um, additional downloads of um, information that wasn't needed uh, because the, the browser will still download, it. say you use media queries in your link tag, it's still going to download all of the different media queries um, that you define. Um, and adapt.js gets around that. Adapt.js also can be used as sort of a starting point for doing what we were looking at earlier, which is inserting content into the page based on um, whether or not uh, um, the screen is wide enough. Um, the other thing that I've seen, um, I think it was um, uh, Slicknick, um, Nick, uh, I forget his last name though, um, Slicknet, Nick. Oh, Nicholas Sakas. Oh, Slicknet, sorry. Slicknet, yeah. Um, Slicknet yeah. on Twitter. He had a blog post recently that was, um, he wasn't doing all the analysis of, um, you know, sort of screen width in JS. Instead what he was doing was he was looking for the uh, appearance or, or non-appearance of elements that were being hidden using media queries, and then based on that, um, having JavaScript trigger. Um, so the advantage of doing something like that would be that you still get to use your media queries, um, your breakpoints are all defined in the same location, um, but your JavaScript is, your JavaScript is sort of listening to the media query to find out when it needs to behave. Um, I think that that's, that's a nice solution, um, but I think all these different pieces are, are pieces that could make sense depending on what the project is. So there's a really quick question from Christina about why um, our example with the uh, Google Map uses an iframe in, in lieu of a div. That's simply the uh, code that Google Maps provides um, so that it can, because it needs the functionality inherent in an iframe to do its thing. Um, yeah, there was a question about using browser cap based solutions to immediately understand browser capabilities even with first load. That's essentially device detection um, and we sort of got to that. Um, I imagine that was earlier in the, in the uh, webinar. Um, and then there was an idea of any good device detection databases. The two main ones are Warful and, um, and Device Atlas. There's an open, there's Apache's trying to start up an open um, uh, device detection database, the Apache Foundation. Um, so hopefully, eventually we'll have um, another option to entertain. Yeah, there's a bit of a vacuum right now in the open source space and truly, or um, over the completely open source free um, version of database, device databases with no licensing um, restrictions. Uh, it is, it, it's a bit of a challenge right now. Yeah. Um, okay, so David or Daniel asks, why would you group by classes of devices when it's more about screen landscape? I may have a smaller screen on my desktop view of your site where I'm doing multiple things um, than on my iPad where I'm only looking at your site. Um, I think this comes back a little bit to the notion of combining um, server-side elements and responsive elements. So um, the server-side decisions you might be making for your desktop group of devices versus your tablet group of devices might not be about screen resolution at all. Maybe it is, but it might well not be about screen resolution. But instead, other things that you, you, you are targeting on those desktop browsers. Um, and then using responsive design on the actual layout to go that last mile and make sure that you're um, flowing your content appropriately across the different devices. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's interesting. We were just we were talking to a client recently whose um, marketing team wanted to market things differently. E-commerce site wanted to market things differently to people on mobile devices versus people who are on um, desktop devices. So that that can happen. Um, you know, there's there are a bunch of different reasons why why this stuff um, might happen. And you know, it's only when you actually get to practical, real world examples that you start to run into um, these sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I think that those were all the questions. Did we, did we grab them all? 
Those are all the questions I see that have come in, so we'll just let folks know real quick. Folks, if you do have a final question for Liza and Jason, please type those in pretty quickly here into the chat box so we can make sure they can answer it while we still have them with us. And if we just wait one second to see if additional ones come in, we'd like to let you all know that Jason and Liza's book, Head First Mobile Web, is the O'Reilly deal of the day. You can get it at a really great price today. Visit O'Reilly.com. Look on the right-hand side. You'll see it right there. It's the O'Reilly deal of the day. And if you like what you heard today, you really need to get that book. We'll turn it back to you folks. And I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, did you have any closing comments for our audience today? Just uh, keep an eye out. Uh, we sh Jason and I will be updating our blog on blog.cloud4.com within the next half hour or so with the promised list of links that we uh, mentioned during the talk today. So keep an eye on that. And uh, if you do have a few questions about some of those tools or um, technologies, uh, you can find it, uh, more information on our blog. Yeah, and the blog and also um, uh, Liza and I are on Twitter. Uh, Liza is Liza Danger, and I'm Greg's G-R-I-G-S. Um, and uh, we are obsessed about mobile, so we talk and think about this stuff all the time. We'd love to hear from you guys.